Introduction Julius Robert Oppenheimer is famous for something he probably never said. After the test detonation of the first atomic weapon, the so-called Trinity Test, at Los Alamos in New Mexico on the 16th of July 1945, Oppenheimer is supposed to have said, quote, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, end quote. This dramatic phrase, typically cited as a direct quotation of the Hindu text Bhagavad Gita, is in fact Oppenheimer's own translation and paraphrase of the text. However, there's no evidence he said this on the day of the Trinity Test, and he didn't mention having said this at all until three years later, in 1948. The earliest and most reliable records of what Oppenheimer said on the day of the actual test instead attribute to him the words, quote, My faith in the human mind has been somewhat restored, end quote, or else simply, quote, It works, end quote. Oppenheimer's quotation for the Bhagavad Gita seems to have first appeared in print in 1948, subsequent to him actually claiming that these were his original words. But regardless of the facts, this memorable phrase has come to characterise the man and his work, and their most likely mythical nature is illustrative of how Oppenheimer himself has become more of a myth than an authentic historical figure. Even during his life, and certainly ever after, Oppenheimer has become a text read and interpreted by a wide range of people, each constructing from him their own narrative. Professor Brian Taylor of the University of Colorado Boulder has written, quote, Many different narratives circulate Oppenheimer in cultural dialogue. Filmmakers, novelists, biographers, playwrights, each with their own political agenda, all sustain the currency of his sign. Their association of Oppenheimer with nuclear science and weapons is a cultural tradition. Not surprisingly then, he is also a signifier through which nuclear scientists interpret themselves and their professional practice. End quote. Words typically used to describe Oppenheimer include complicated and complex, terms often used to characterise non-committally those with whom people are uncomfortable. The script for this video was written before Christopher Nolan's 2023 movie Oppenheimer was released, so it does not comment on the movie's content. Instead, it examines the three most common identities with which Oppenheimer has been associated in popular culture and historical commentary, covering these topics. 1. Oppenheimer, atomic hero. 2. Oppenheimer, destroyer of worlds. 3. Oppenheimer, communist. Use the timestamps in the video description to navigate the content. Oppenheimer, Atomic Hero Despite Oppenheimer's significant involvement in the making of the atomic bomb, being both one of the major contributing physicists and the director of the Los Alamos laboratory in which the bomb was designed and built, history has been remarkably kind to him, and he has been widely regarded as an imperfect but well-meaning hero. This is illustrated well by an article published on the 18th of July 2023 by online magazine The Conversation, which depicts Oppenheimer highly sympathetically, claiming that just after Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed, quote, Oppenheimer confronted the US Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, demanding that nuclear weapons were banned, end quote, and citing a conversation with US President Harry Truman in which Oppenheimer, quote, talked about his feeling of having blood on his hands, end quote. The article adds that, quote, the responsibility for the use of the atomic bombs, after all, rested with the commander-in-chief, end quote, contributing strongly to a characterization of Oppenheimer as the unfortunate tool of powerful forces. There are several reasons why such a positive image of Oppenheimer is widely held today. The first is the perception that Oppenheimer's support for the building and use of the bomb was a position he held with moral reluctance and only on the basis that the alternatives were even more morally repugnant. Oppenheimer was quoted by his colleagues as justifying the bomb's construction with the position, quote, look, what if the Nazis get to it first, end quote. Similarly, his support of dropping the bomb on Japan is seen as a justifiable response to what seemed like an impossible military deadlock which could only be broken either by horrendous loss of American and Japanese lives in conventional warfare or by the use of an unstoppable weapon which would bring Japan instantly to its knees in a manner which would spare many American soldiers. On the 16th of June 1945, Oppenheimer co-signed a letter recommending, quote, the immediate use of nuclear weapons, end quote, on the grounds of, quote, the opportunity of saving American lives by immediate military use, end quote. 
Additionally, it is widely accepted that Oppenheimer believed the use of the bomb on Japan would provide such a terrible demonstration of the power of nuclear weapons that they would never be used in war again. Historian Barton J. Bernstein asserts that Oppenheimer, with other scientists, quote, concluded that the use of the bomb on Japan might well improve the prospects for peace because the bomb would demonstrate that future war was too horrible, end quote. Oppenheimer's reputation has been further improved by the perception that he deeply regretted making the bomb and in particular regretted its use against Japan. An article in Business Insider on the 22nd of July 2023 cites historian Kai Bird claiming Oppenheimer, quote, plunged into a deep depression after reading news reports about what the atomic bomb did to the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, end quote, and, quote, didn't think it was necessary or justified to drop the second bomb, end quote. Science historians Abraham Pace and Robert P. Kreese assert that the bombing of Hiroshima caused many of the scientists responsible for the bomb to feel, quote, a moral repugnance for weapons work, end quote. They associate this regret with Oppenheimer specifically, writing, quote, even Oppenheimer, who had supported and urged the thermonuclear effort for years, turned his back on the project. Publicly, he announced, the physicists have known sin, end quote. In support of this, Pace and Kreese quote Edward Teller's report of a meeting with Oppenheimer. According to Teller, quote, privately on the day of Hiroshima, he came to my Los Alamos office for a long talk. He told me that we would not develop a hydrogen bomb. Before Nagasaki, before the war was over, Oppenheimer made it clear to me that he would have nothing further to do with thermonuclear work, end quote. An additional and oft-cited story of Oppenheimer's regret over the use of the bomb against Japan tells of a meeting he had with President Harry Truman in which he referred to the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki saying, quote, Mr. President, I feel I have blood on my hands, end quote. According to this account, which was repeated frequently by Truman himself, the president was disgusted by Oppenheimer's sentimental apology and referred to him in conversation with others as a, quote, crybaby scientist, end quote. Historian of science Sylvan S. Schweber supports the narrative of Oppenheimer's regret, quoting German-British physicist Rudolf Peierls, who wrote that Oppenheimer, quote, remained acutely conscious of the responsibility he bore for his part in developing atomic weapons and in the decision to use them, end quote. In 1956, Oppenheimer told graduating students at George School, the elite private school where he sent his son Peter, that the bombing of Hiroshima was, quote, a tragic mistake, end quote, resulting from the loss of, quote, a certain sense of restraint, end quote, by US leaders. The story of Oppenheimer's regret over the use of the bomb against Japan became further enshrined through the arts. German playwright Heinar Kippart's 1964 TV film, In the Matter of J. Robert Oppenheimer, depicted the physicist as regretting his involvement in the atomic bomb project. Similarly, in 2015, British playwright Tom Morton Smith's dramatisation called Oppenheimer, performed by the prestigious Royal Shakespeare Company in the Swan Theatre at Stratford-upon-Avon, showed Oppenheimer regretting the deaths of Japanese children resulting from the atomic bomb. Oppenheimer's resistance to the development of the much more powerful hydrogen bomb is also cited as evidence for his feelings of guilt and regret over his involvement in the creation of nuclear weapons. Historian of science Lawrence Badash wrote, quote, Some scientific advisors to the AEC labelled the H-bomb a weapon of genocide, an immoral weapon, Oppenheimer opposed the development of fusion weapons and did not work on them, end quote. Likewise, historian Greg Herkin writes, quote, In 1949, Oppenheimer would oppose development of the hydrogen bomb on both practical and ethical grounds, end quote. Oppenheimer's oft-cited regret for his involvement in the creation of the atomic bomb and its use against Japan, as well as his opposition to the development of the hydrogen bomb, have been used successfully to rehabilitate him as a tragic hero compelled by circumstance, whose primary faults were simply a lack of hindsight and a desire to end the war as quickly and humanely as possible. In fact, closer examination of the historical evidence overturns this characterization of Oppenheimer completely, proving it to be nothing more than a convenient and arguably unethical myth. Oppenheimer, 
destroyer of worlds. It is ironic that the phrase for which Oppenheimer is most well known is a better characterization of his impact on history than the heroic portrayal from which his reputation has benefited. There is overwhelming evidence that Oppenheimer was not only fully aware of the atomic bomb's destructive power long before it was used, that he was also fully aware of its deadly long-term consequences, that he actively resisted efforts to avoid using it on Japan, that he never regretted its use, and that his opposition to the hydrogen bomb was derived from practical rather than moral concerns. In a letter on the 6th of October 1944 to Brigadier General Leslie Groves, Oppenheimer made it totally clear what his personal objectives with the Manhattan Project were, writing, quote, The laboratory is under a directive to produce weapons. This directive has been and will be rigorously adhered to, end quote. Oppenheimer wanted to complete the atomic bomb as soon as possible and use it on the battlefield as soon as possible. He even expressed his opposition to testing the bomb before using it in war, explaining that the only reason why a test was even being considered was that, quote, this appears to be a necessary step in the production of a weapon, end quote. In January 1944, when asked to calculate the bomb's efficiency, Oppenheimer and his colleague George Kistakowski estimated that its explosive force would be equivalent to 2,000 tons of TNT, more than three times an earlier estimate. Later, Oppenheimer was recorded in meeting minutes as asserting that an atomic bomb blast, quote, would be equivalent to about 2,000 to 20,000 tons of TNT, end quote, and that, quote, the neutron effect of the explosion would be dangerous to life for a radius of at least two-thirds of a mile, end quote. This demonstrates Oppenheimer was fully aware of the bomb's incomparable destructive power and that he was also already aware of the deadly effect of its radioactive fallout, a fact that wasn't completely understood even by members of the US military until well after the bombs had been dropped. Consequently, it is indisputable that Oppenheimer understood completely the utterly appalling consequences of the weapon he was building and exactly how destructive it would be to human life. His enthusiasm for the building of this weapon certainly contradicts the idea of an anguished scientist wrestling with his conscience as he is forced into a course of action he desperately wishes to avoid. This is further supported by descriptions of Oppenheimer's character provided by his close colleagues. In 1943, physicist Enrico Fermi, responsible for the building of the first nuclear reactor, which was instrumental to the success of the atomic bomb project, suggested using radioactive material from the reactor to contaminate German food supplies. It's important to understand that this was a reference to civilian food supplies. Rather than being appalled by the suggestion, Oppenheimer received it with enthusiasm and proposed it to Brigadier General Groves. Oppenheimer's only cause for concern over this plan was that it might not kill enough Germans. In a reply to Fermi, Oppenheimer wrote, quote, I think that we should not attempt a plan unless we can poison food sufficient to kill a half a million men, since there is no doubt that the actual number affected will, because of non-uniform distribution, be much smaller than this, end quote. Oppenheimer's brutally callous attitude towards German civilian deaths by radiation poisoning was a foreshadowing of his later justification of the deaths of thousands of Japanese civilians by dropping the atomic bomb. As these aspects of his character came to light, some of his colleagues found themselves repelled. Polish-British physicist Dosef Rodblat later wrote, quote, I had a great admiration for Oppenheimer at the time that I met him in Los Alamos. Really, he was a hero for me, for various reasons, including that I believed him to be a humanitarian. Gradually, things came to my knowledge. I felt, this is not the way a hero of mine should behave. Gradually, he became an anti-hero, end quote. In 1939, Albert Einstein wrote a letter encouraging President Roosevelt to make every effort to develop a nuclear weapon, explaining that this would result in, quote, extremely powerful bombs of a new type, end quote. Einstein noted Canada and the former Czechoslovakia were viable sources of uranium, but observed, quote, the most important source of uranium is Belgian Congo, 
end quote. As a result of Einstein's advice, 1,000 tons of uranium were purchased from Canada and at least 4,200 tons from Congo, mined by local Congolese civilians in appallingly unsafe conditions under the tyrannical rule of the Belgian colonial government. The 2016 book, Spies in the Congo, by historian Susan Williams, tells the rest of this narrative and its awful consequences for Congo during the Cold War. The letter was co-signed by Hungarian physicist Leo Szilard. Unlike Oppenheimer, Szilard started having serious and genuine regrets about the development of the atomic bomb even before it was complete, and on the 11th of June 1945, still a month before the first bomb was tested on US soil, Silla co-signed a report addressed to the US Secretary of War, which strongly recommended the bomb should not be used in war, but instead, quote, a demonstration of the new weapon may best be made before the eyes of representatives of all United Nations on the desert or a barren island, end quote. Silla and the other co-signatories believed that the US should demonstrate publicly to the world that, although it had the power to use the bomb against human targets, it would not do so in order to encourage other nations to likewise pledge never to use it in war. The report stated explicitly, quote, The best possible atmosphere for the achievement of an international agreement could be achieved if America would be able to say to the world, You see what weapon we had, but did not use. We are ready to renounce its use in the future and to join other nations in working out adequate supervision of the use of this nuclear weapon. End quote. On the 17th of July 1945, the day after the first testing of the atomic bomb, 70 scientists, including Silla, signed a petition aimed directly at President Harry Truman, urging him not to use the bomb in the war, given that Germany had already been defeated. The petition read, quote, We, the undersigned scientists, have been working in the field of atomic power. Until recently, we have had to fear that the United States might be attacked by atomic bombs during this war and that her only defense might lie in a counterattack by the same means. Today, with the defeat of Germany, this danger is averted and we feel impelled to say what follows, end quote. The scientists strongly urged Truman, quote, to rule that the United States shall not resort to the use of atomic bombs in this war unless the terms which will be opposed upon Japan have been made public in detail and Japan, knowing these terms, has refused to surrender, end quote. The letter described the scientists' moral objections over dropping the bomb on Japan, saying, quote, the war has to be brought speedily to a successful conclusion and attacks by atomic bombs may very well be an effective method of warfare. We feel, however, that such attacks on Japan could not be justified, at least not until the terms which will be imposed after the war on Japan were made public in detail and Japan were given an opportunity to surrender." End quote. They further correctly identified the danger of the US starting a nuclear arms race if it used the atomic bomb in war, writing, quote, Thus, a nation which sets the precedent of using these newly liberated forces of nature for purposes of destruction may have to bear the responsibility of opening the door to an era of devastation on an unimaginable scale. End quote. Unsurprisingly, Oppenheimer did not sign this petition. In fact, not only did he oppose it, he even prohibited its distribution at Los Alamos, in direct contravention of Silla's request. Rotblatt, cited previously, explained that Oppenheimer, quote, agreed that the bomb should be used on the cities, end quote, adding, quote, he could have said no, and at that time he was powerful enough that his voice might have prevailed. He agreed, together with the military, that it should be used against civilians. This was one of the things which I felt was wrong, end quote. Oppenheimer was repeatedly faced with opposition to his willingness to drop the bomb, but consistently rejected any suggestion that the bomb should not be used. When Oppenheimer was made consultant for a committee canvassing views on the bomb, he asked physicist Robert Wilson for his opinion on how the bomb should be used. In Wilson's own words, he told Oppenheimer, quote, I felt that it should not be used and that the Japanese should be alerted to it in some manner, end quote. Oppenheimer did not share this view, 
and did not recommend it to the committee. Similarly, when physicist Philip Morrison spoke at a committee advising Japan be given some kind of formal warming of the bomb, Oppenheimer gave him no support. Oppenheimer himself confirmed this in a later description of the meeting, saying he had presented the arguments against using the bomb on Japan, quote, but I did not endorse them, end quote. Oppenheimer's views prevailed in the committee, which dismissed the suggestion of giving Japan a demonstration of the bomb on uninhabited territory, and instead decided it was necessary to use it on a military target surrounded by people. The justification given was that this would end the war faster than any other option. Oppenheimer's response to the bomb being dropped was completely predictable on the basis of his previous statements. In response to an enthusiastic crowd, Oppenheimer was cited by physicist Samuel Cohen as saying it was too early to determine the results, but that he was sure that the Japanese didn't like it. According to Cohen, Oppenheimer's only regret, quote, was that we hadn't developed the bomb in time to have used it against the Germans, end quote. Oppenheimer's opposition to the development of the much more powerful hydrogen bomb is well documented, but it is in fact so well documented that crediting it to any moral concerns over the bomb is simply not credible. His objection to the hydrogen bomb is described in detail in his statement to Secretary of War Henry Stimson, in which he expressed his concern that there was no possible defence against such a weapon, and that its development would start an arms race which would quickly erode US dominance of atomic warfare. None of these were moral concerns, they were fears of the US losing its status as the sole global nuclear superpower. Rotblatt, cited previously, clearly held this interpretation of Oppenheimer's motivations, later saying, quote, He opposed the hydrogen bomb. I always thought that he opposed it for moral reasons, the same way that Rabi did or Fermi did, on pure moral grounds. And then I found out he did not oppose it on moral grounds. At least, this is not openly, end quote. In Rothblatt's words, Oppenheimer said that, quote, Militarily, there was no need for America to have the hydrogen bomb. We'll do much better by developing tactical nuclear weapons, end quote. Rothblatt added, quote, And again, I was greatly disappointed that he should have taken this stand, end quote. On the 24th of July 2023, an article in the Washington Post ran with the title, The Atomic Bombings Left Oppenheimer Shattered. I have blood on my hands. This clearly identified the article's aim, though it did not avoid an uncomfortable confrontation with historical facts, opening with the acknowledgement that when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, quote, Oppenheimer celebrated by clasping his hands like a prize fighter, soaking in the roaring applause from the crowd, end quote. However, it also claims, quote, but Oppenheimer's feeling of triumph evaporated in the months after the destruction of Nagasaki, caused by another atomic bomb three days after Hiroshima, which the scientist believed was unnecessary and unjustified. His mood changed three days later when the FBI described Oppenheimer as a nervous wreck over bombing Nagasaki, which he argued was not justified from a military perspective." End quote. Unfortunately, the article cites no direct sources for these statements, merely juxtaposing them with Oppenheimer's visit to Truman in which he spoke of having blood on his hands, a statement we have examined previously. Although the article attempts to hint strongly at Oppenheimer's regret over the use of the bomb on Japan, it never quite manages to cite any historical evidence for this regret, and even more importantly, it never addresses the historical evidence that Oppenheimer felt no regret, as he himself stated. In 1962, Oppenheimer supported the view that dropping the bomb had been necessary to end the war quickly, saying that a conventional invasion of Japan would have been, quote, clearly much more terrible in every way and for everyone concerned than the use of the bomb, end quote. However, he also added, quote, my own feeling is that if the bombs were to be used, there could have been more effective warning and much less wanton killing than took place in the heat of the battle and confusion of the campaign, end quote. This is perhaps the closest he ever came to actually expressing regret for the bomb's use on Japan, and even here he only suggests the Japanese could have been given a better warning. In an interview in 1965, Oppenheimer said he still didn't know if the atomic bombing of Japan was necessary, which was, again, not exactly regret for the action. 
In fact, he added that the bombing had been decided on, quote, in good faith, with regret, and on the best evidence that they then had, end quote. Again, commenting that it still seemed to him the bomb had been necessary, saying, quote, The ending of the war by this means, certainly cruel, was not undertaken lightly, but I am not, as of today, confident that a better course was then open, end quote. These are not the words of a man in regret, but a man justifying a decision he fully acknowledges was terrible. This has been noted by a number of scholars. Science historian Robert P. Kreese writes that many of the scientists who later campaigned against nuclear weapons, including Oppenheimer himself, had no regrets about their work on the Manhattan Project. In 1960, Oppenheimer visited Tokyo, where he was asked directly about the decision to drop the bomb and reportedly replied, quote, I do not regret that I had something to do with the technical success of the atomic bomb. It isn't that I don't feel bad, it is that I don't feel worse tonight than I did last night, end quote. Similarly, historian Barton J. Bernstein quotes Oppenheimer stating in 1965, quote, I never regretted and do not regret now having done my part of the job. I have a deep, continuing, haunting sense of the damage done to European culture by the two world wars. The existence of the bomb has reduced the chance of World War III and has given us valid hope, end quote. In fact, Oppenheimer himself even opposed efforts to rehabilitate his image as a regretful architect of a necessary evil. When a German play was made in the 1960s, depicting Oppenheimer making a passionate speech of regret over his involvement in the bomb, Oppenheimer wrote to the playwright expressing his objections in very strong terms. In Oppenheimer's words, quote, Even this September, in Geneva, I was asked by the Canon von Kamp whether now, knowing the results, I would again do what I did during the war, participate in a responsible way in the making of atomic weapons. To this, I answered, yes. When a voice in the audience angrily asked, even after Hiroshima, I repeated my yes, end quote. This is clearly not the response of a regretful man. In 1966, Oppenheimer was again asked about his feelings over his part in making the bomb, and this same play was cited. In a written response, Oppenheimer replied, quote, The play and such things have been rattling around for a long time. What I have never done is to express regret for doing what I did and could at Los Alamos. In fact, on varied and recurrent occasions, I have reaffirmed my sense that, with all the black and white, that was something I did not regret. End quote. Oppenheimer added a further statement to the letter, expressing his contempt for the German play in which he was depicted as regretful, writing, quote, My principal remaining disgust with Kippard's text is the long and totally improvised final speech I am supposed to have made, which indeed affirms such regret. My own feelings about responsibility and guilt have always to do with the present, and so far in this life that has been more than enough to occupy me, end quote. However, he removed this part of the letter before sending it. This summary of Oppenheimer's views during the bomb's development, during the discussion of its use, and before and even long after it was dropped, demonstrates clearly that he consistently held the view that both the bomb's construction and its use on Japan were not only entirely justified, but even militarily and morally necessary. Oppenheimer, Communist Oppenheimer's relation to communism has been obscured greatly by the charges made against him by a US government investigation in 1953. That investigation, occurring during yet another Red Scare in the US, unearthed Oppenheimer's lengthy association with socialists and his involvement with various socialist and communist parties. However, closer inspection demonstrates that, despite being sympathetic to certain socialist groups, Oppenheimer himself was never an actual communist or socialist, and was in fact described even by contemporary communists as merely a fellow traveller, a sympathiser with communists and their aims, but not an active participant in them. Popular views of Oppenheimer sometimes emphasise his communist connections. In British playwright Tom Morton Smith's 2015 biographical play, Oppenheimer is seen in close proximity with socialists and sharing socialist literature with his physics students. However, the play also shows Oppenheimer willing to sacrifice his socialist associations for his career ambitions. 
depicting him as being required to separate himself from his leftist friends in return for participation in the Manhattan Project. There is historical evidence that something like this did actually happen. In 1942, when Oppenheimer was being considered for participation in the Manhattan Project, his security clearance was still being denied on the basis of his known association with socialism. In a conversation with a friend, Oppenheimer apparently said, quote, I'm cutting off every communist connection, for if I don't, the government will find it difficult to use me. I don't want to let anything interfere with my usefulness to the nation, end quote. This certainly demonstrates that, despite Oppenheimer's connection to socialists, he was certainly not sufficiently dedicated to the socialist cause to ever let it endanger his career. Oppenheimer's relatively weak links to socialists were clearly of little concern to the US government at the time of his enrolment in the Manhattan Project. When completing the project's security questionnaire in 1942, he even wrote that he had been, quote, a member of just about every communist front organisation on the West Coast, end quote. This was a statement which would be raised as evidence against him in the investigation of 1953. In contrast, back in 1942, Oppenheimer's socialist associations, though well known and recognised by the US government, were not considered sufficiently important to prevent him from involvement in the Manhattan Project. In the words of presidential science advisor Vannevar Bush, although Oppenheimer was, quote, decidedly left-wing politically, end quote, he had nevertheless, quote, contributed substantially, end quote, to the development of atomic science, and should therefore receive a security clearance. The 1953 investigation of Oppenheimer cited his direct association with socialists and communists over years, back to at least 1936. Yet this was all known to the US government before Oppenheimer was accepted into the Manhattan Project in 1942. This again demonstrates that Oppenheimer's connections with communism and socialists were considered insignificant by the US government when considering Oppenheimer for participation in the development of the atomic bomb even at a time when concerns over national security were at their highest. It was recognised that these were fairly tenuous connections and that though Oppenheimer certainly had socialist sympathies, he was by no means a self-identified socialist nor a dedicated communist. So not only is there no direct evidence that Oppenheimer himself was ever an actual socialist or communist, not only is there no evidence that self-identifying socialists and communists ever regarded him as one of their own, but the US government itself, despite knowing of his years of association with socialist and communist individuals and groups, did not view him as either a socialist or communist in 1942 when he was enrolled in the Manhattan Project. The 1953 investigation into Oppenheimer was not prompted by any communist or socialist activity on the part of Oppenheimer. Instead, it was motivated by concerns over his reluctance to develop the hydrogen bomb and suspicions raised over his apparent involvement with the Soviet attempt to gain atomic research from the US scientists. On the 1st of March 1943, Soviet Vice Consul Peter Ivanov contacted British physicist George Eltonton to gather information about research at the US Radiation Laboratory for the benefit of Russian scientists. Eltonton attempted to gain this information through Harkon Chevalier, a friend of Oppenheimer, who approached Oppenheimer on Eltonton's behalf. However, it seems Oppenheimer was uncooperative since even the 1953 investigation concluded, quote, Chevalier finally advised George Charles Eltonton that there was no chance whatsoever of obtaining the information, end quote. Regardless, this incident was still cited during the 1953 investigation as grounds for suspicion of Oppenheimer's loyalty on the basis that Oppenheimer, quote, did not report this episode to the appropriate authorities until several months after its occurrence, end quote, did not reveal that he himself had been contacted by Chevalier and did not identify Chevalier's involvement. But this was still no evidence at all that Oppenheimer was either a communist or socialist, and the fact that he made the decision not to share the information requested indicated that he regarded his loyalty to the US and its nuclear supremacy as more important than sharing scientific information with Soviet scientists. On the 4th of March 1954, Oppenheimer replied to a letter by Major General Kenneth Nichols, which documented Oppenheimer's lengthy association with communist and socialist organisations and individuals over the years. Although Oppenheimer was clearly motivated to distance himself from these past associations, his defence of his previous conduct was demonstrably valid. 
Oppenheimer explained that, in the early years of his connection with socialists, he had little understanding of the Soviet Union, but that over time, quote, I found myself increasingly out of sympathy with the policy of disengagement and neutrality that the communist press advocated, end quote. He acknowledged freely that due to his associations with and support for various socialist and communist organisations, quote, I might well have appeared at the time as quite close to the Communist Party, perhaps even to some people as belonging to it, end quote. Even adding, quote, some of its declared objectives seemed to me desirable, end quote. Nevertheless, he insisted, quote, I was never a member of the Communist Party. I never accepted communist dogma or theory. In fact, it never made sense to me, end quote. Further asserting, quote, in most cases, I did not in those days know who was and who was not a member of the Communist Party. No one ever asked me to join the Communist Party, end quote. Although it was clearly in Oppenheimer's best interest to make such claims, it certainly did not serve his interest to voluntarily acknowledge that he had sympathised with the objectives of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and that he had been sufficiently close to the Communist Party to warrant people believing he was a member. It seems Oppenheimer felt confident about describing his previous close proximity with the Communist Party precisely because he knew there was no evidence that he had ever been a real socialist or communist, and that there was demonstrable evidence that he had separated from his socialist associates in 1942 as a condition of joining the Manhattan Project. Academic and former US Senator Jeff Bingerman writes, quote, Undoubtedly Oppenheimer had friends and relatives who were communists. Most of those associations had been formed long before the war, and most had long since ended. All of them had been thoroughly scrutinised by the army when it cleared him in 1943 and by the Atomic Energy Commission when it cleared him in 1947, end quote. The 1953 investigation of Oppenheimer also cited his reluctance to develop the hydrogen bomb, but even the evidence cited indicated that Oppenheimer was motivated not by political or ethical concerns, but by his scientific doubts over its practicality. Bingerman, cited previously, writes, quote, it was Dr. Oppenheimer's opposition to the H-bomb more than anything else that made his opponents into enemies and fueled their suspicions of his loyalty. But the commission went further and charged him with having expressed views opposing the development of the H-bomb. That was the crux of the matter. End quote. Despite the lack of evidence on which to bring charges against Oppenheimer and the very clear evidence available in his defence, the 1953 investigation was successful in its aims. The Atomic Energy Commission ultimately revoked Oppenheimer's security clearance and he was discharged from the Atomic Energy Program. Oppenheimer's investigation in 1953 was not prompted by any socialist or communist behaviour, nor was it prompted by his involvement with socialists and socialist groups. Virtually all of the information about Oppenheimer's involvement with socialists which was brought to the investigation had been well known even before he joined the Manhattan Project a decade earlier in 1942, and it was also known that he had cut off those associations as a condition of joining the project. The 1953 investigation is not remotely a demonstration that Oppenheimer was a communist. It was a typical reactionary inquisition prompted by Oppenheimer's objection to the development of the hydrogen bomb and driven by the anti-communist fever at the time. Oppenheimer was never either a socialist or communist. Conclusion I will remind you that the script for this video was written before Christopher Nolan's 2023 movie Oppenheimer was released, so it does not comment on the movie's content. There will undoubtedly be much in the movie to examine from a historical perspective, and I will certainly review the movie at some point after I have seen it. Instead, this video has critiqued the three most common stereotypes of Oppenheimer as found in popular culture and media, pop history, and even academic commentary, exposing the false narratives about Oppenheimer to which they contribute, and critiquing contemporary attempts to rehabilitate Oppenheimer and distance him from culpability for his involvement in the atomic bombing of Japan. The ethics of that bombing and the long debated subject of whether or not it was either necessary or justified and whether or not it caused Japan's surrender, will be the subject of a lengthy video I intend to make in the future. If you enjoyed this video and you would like to see more of my work, please see my Patreon page where you can gain benefits such as getting to see videos a week early, 
the vote on future videos, getting to attend a monthly live stream, suggest video topics that will be voted on, requesting I check a meme, article or video for accuracy for you, and even getting me to make an entire video for you.